Well, thank you all so much for, for being here. Um, I just wanted to introduce uh, briefly our, our three panelists. Unfortunately, Congresswoman Moore had uh, a vote uh, today and, and uh, couldn't be here. Um, the bill she was she was uh, sponsoring, but anyway, um, to my to my left we have uh, Jason DeParle, who is a staff writer at the New York Times and a Bernard L. Schwartz Fellow here at New America. In the middle, uh, Katie Royfe. Um, Katie is the author of several books, including uh, In Praise of Messy Lives, which discusses, among other things, her experience as a single mother, and she's also a professor at the um, uh, the Carter Institute of Journalism at NYU. And on the end, uh, we have Devira Cohn. Um, Devira was a journalist herself for many years at the Washington Post, and she's now a senior writer at the Pew Research Center, um, and who has frequently studied uh, marriage patterns and other aspects of, of changing family life in, in America. So thank you all so much. So um, well, we're all um, familiar with some of the, the recent numbers that have, have come out um, relating to single motherhood. The, the CDC report in March that, that showed that the number of uh, American children born to single mothers in America is at an all-time high. Um, the Pew report uh, that came out a couple of weeks ago at the end of, at the end of uh, uh, May um, that, that showed that um, Sort of record numbers of female female breadwinners, especially in in households um, that are that are uh, female headed, and I guess I, I I was hoping we could start by discussing some of the factors that that might be um, driving this trend. Um, maybe, um, well, maybe this is the question for for D. Um, well, there. I guess one thing to say up front is that there are many different kinds of single moms that the average numbers that you see hide a lot of variety. And so that also helps explain some of the factors that are driving the increase. So on the one hand, you, you do see an increase in, in children being born to women who've never married. Well, to some extent, that reflects the fact that marriage uh, is becoming less prevalent in US society. People are marrying later. There's some evidence that a smaller number may ever marry, although many people say that they would like to be married. So uh, that, that's one factor driving that population. Uh, there's also been a growth in cohabitation or unmarried partners, people living together. Uh, that is also driving the numbers in so-called single moms. In fact, a lot of the increase we're seeing in, in children living with mothers who allegedly are single are, child, are uh, involve kids who actually are living with two parents, the, but the parents are living together and not married. And then, of course, there's also, the, there's also issues like divorce, separation, and so forth. And even though divorce has leveled off or, or decreased in recent years, it still affects a large number of children and their living circumstances. Um, Jason, you've done a lot of work on uh, how these changes of in, in family formation are driving um, inequality, rising inequality in America. Um, I wondered if you, could, if you could maybe talk about you know, the origins of that Well, let's go back work. to your, your earlier yeah. question about why I think there's a debate mm -hmm. uh, that will never be settled about to what extent is it being driven by economic changes mm -hmm. on the fall of wages, particularly for low-skilled men that make them seem less marriageable, and to what extent it's being um, driven by cultural changes uh, relating to, among other things, birth control and um, you know, a broader um, <coughs> acceptance of, uh, of uh, unmarried uh, parenthood. Mm -hmm. um, and the two things, um, I think, interact. Um, in terms of uh, uh, the way it interacts with the inequality debate uh, or the inequality trends, the, oh, sure. um, uh, the move towards sing, uh, single motherhood is um, varies a lot by education level. Mm -hmm. So college educated Mar Americans still um, marry and have children within marriage at very high rates. Uh, Americans with high school educations and less uh, uh, do not by and large have, have children outside of marriage. Um, those two trends have been the uh, that way for or four decades, I think what's changed really in the last decade or uh, decade and a half is what's happened in the middle. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and the middle used to more closely resemble the top. Mm -hmm. If you go back, I want to say maybe two decades ago, uh, you look at the top uh, third and the middle third, um, and the family structure looked pretty much the same. And uh, now there's been an erosion in um, uh, uh, the trend towards marriage, having births within marriage. There's been an erosion mm -hmm. that, among both thirds, but it's been much steeper in the middle third. So the middle third is shifting um, more towards the bottom third in terms of family structure. Um, how that affects the inequality debate is that the people who least um, need to be married for economic reasons are the most likely to. So the people with the highest incomes are most likely to have two incomes in the household. And the people with the lowest incomes are most likely to have one income in, in the household. Um, so it exacerbates the, uh, the trend towards inequality. I mean, what you you mentioned um, at the beginning of your comment, uh, the increasing acceptance of, of single motherhood, and one of the things that I, I was discussing with Dee yesterday was that, in fact, um, given the, the the increase we're seeing in these these new patterns of family formation, there, there's actually less acceptance, less public acceptance of, of, uh, of single motherhood than, than you would, would think. I, you, can, you can speak to this better than I can, but, but you were describing some public opinion surveys that, that had been done. Um, I was hoping you could... Sure. Yeah. Well, we've been polling about a number of changes in family forms for some time, and what we found is that public disapproval of single mothers or single women having children is still quite high. Um, the latest survey was about 64 percent. Now that that was down from uh, 71 percent a few years ago, and disapproval is lower. So single mothers or non-marital births? Well, that's it has some extent to to do with how the question is phrased. Um, if you say single women having children, is that a big problem? That that was the way our question was worded. So. Uh, but if you ask about um, unmarried parents living with children, disapproval is a lot lower. Um, and, and, and it is also a lot lower for same-sex couples raising children um, than it is for, if, if you frame it as a single woman by herself without a man um, involved. So it, you know, there is a little wiggle room in the, in the disapproval. And there is some, as, as we've said, softening of disapproval. And of course, disapproval is much lower among younger people whose lives are, have reflect a, a much greater prevalence of this mm -hmm. kind of single parenthood. So they're, mm -hmm. what they're seeing um, may be reflected in, in their attitudes. Did you um, look at the, uh, what single parents say about what the, what the approval, disapproval rate would be among people who are uh, themselves? themselves single the 42 percent are having children yeah. outside of marriage. It's much less, uh, but it's not zero. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't have the numbers right at hand, mm -hmm. but the, there's still some disapproval, but it, it's not nearly as. So but and it's, I think, it's not quite a majority, as I, as I recall. I think when we talk about the disapproval, um, it's important to look at the crudeness of the terms, as you were saying. So that, to me, the term single mother itself is um, the fiction of a fundamentally conservative society. Um, and in England, J.K. Rowling's organization, Gingerbread, um, has this movement called Lose the Labels. And the reason being, and her point, which I think is quite valid, um, that women move in and out of singleness in the course of a lifetime. People get divorced and suddenly find themselves a single mother for a year. People have babies on their own with sperm donors. As you're saying, these are very different circumstances. People have babies on their own living together with the father. And so these terms are pretty unuseful, actually. Um, and the term single mother, you know, what, just to ask people if they disapprove of it, is um, already entering into a sort of a very charged kind of language to talk about these things. So I think one of the problems is that the term itself is, it conjures all these stereotypes and ideas for people that may not really reflect the kind of you know, variety of human experience. It seemed to be the case when you were describing the public opinion um, surveys when we spoke yesterday that that um, other social trends such as such as gay marriage and and such as cohabitation, people's um, public opinion has more kept pace with that. People have become 
widely have become much more accepting of gay marriage very quickly as it's become more common and, and they you know they know they know people in the institution um, people have become much more accepting of, of cohabitation for some reason it seems that 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 uh, public acceptance of, of single motherhood has not really kept pace with the the increases in, in and I, I guess Boy, that's not my impression I mean, that's not your impression no okay. I'm, I, I've I don't think I ever meet yeah. anybody who, who expresses any surprise or disapproval or about mm. single parenthood mm. these days. It seems uh, it's the, almost a, a norm. You and I were talking. I've been spending a lot of time at a um, public school in uh, in Texas, mm -hmm. uh, in in the second grade class. I've, I've been monitoring. I've noticed that when the teacher sends home permission slips, she says quite unselfconsciously. You know, have have your mom or your mom's boyfriend or your aunt or your grandmother or you know like whoever <laughs> uh, sign it. it. It's not a pejorative thing. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, uh, I I think there are maybe one out of five kids in the class, if that has a two-parent family. Well, certainly the numbers, as we've said, the num there's no dis disputing that the numbers of children of single parents is high. However. We do live in a country where one of the presidential candidates recently blamed the increase in violence essentially on single mothers. So we are living in a world in which it's okay to say that, you know, for a politician to say, a quite prominent politician of one of the major parties to say that. Um, so I think, you know, I, I mean, I live in New York City and I could just wish that I lived in that Texas school because I don't see that kind of um, totally warm hearted acceptance around me. Um, and I don't, and obviously the numbers bear out, um, even though it's gone down slightly, that huge numbers of Americans do say they disapprove of children being raised by single mothers. But again, uh, they don't disapprove of children being raised by two unmarried parents, and one of those unmarried parents is also a single mom. So it really depends on, the, I think, the definition of single mom. We also have research, and I think this bears on the, the single mom definition, where uh, Americans have a strong, um, strong belief that children benefit by having um, both a mother and father present in the household. And I think that, that that's part of what's going on in the high disapproval for moms raising children on their own. And the lesser disapproval, I mean, really only a minority disapprove of uh, unmarried couples raising kids. Is that, is that um, do you think, due to the, the practical difficulties or the sense that there are fewer resources? Or, or is it just about the, the fact of having a father in the home? I don't do know. Think? It'd be interesting, it would be interesting to test that. Um, we actually did, did ask a question recently that we'll, we'll be publishing some data about about what the role of a dad is, because I was curious about that as well. Um, I, you know, I don't know whether it's the fact that if it helps to have two people if you're trying to run after a toddler or whether having two incomes is more helpful than having one, or, or whether there's a moral component. And we certainly know that among people who describe themselves as religious or uh, who have conservative mm -hmm. political views, there, there is more disapproval of the single mom on her own than well, there is. By any measure, over the last two decades, there's got to be a trend towards greater public acceptance of single parenthood, no? A pretty surprisingly low, I mean, if you look at the acceptance of gay parents is surprisingly higher among even conservative people than the acceptance of a single mother. And I think that's what the interesting thing is, why do we still have this particular pocket of kind of traditional conservatism and why does it endure? And I think there is, frankly, a moral component. Obviously, it's impossible to measure, but I think if you look at the language that people use to talk about single mothers, you mm -hmm. see a pretty, you know, that in a certain way this country has not evolved as far as we think from um, the days of Nathaniel Hawthorne and Hester Prynne, our kind of original puritanical, you know, town with its single mother with the Scarlet A. And some of that feeling of suspicion, and I think, I do think it's a sort of irrational moral issue, not just, not just the kind of practical concerns, I think. Um, well, there's certainly well, been an, uh, an evolution of academic evidence over the past several decades that suggests all else equal, kids um, uh, do better in two-parent families on average. So kids are going to be more likely to um, uh, do well in school, more likely to stay out of trouble uh, in a two-parent family. So I think the consensus mm -hmm. among uh, the liberal academics has shifted over the past two decades, but I wouldn't say it translates into a moral disapproval. I would say that there's been a, 
uh, a, a shift among liberal academics. I'm thinking of somebody like Sarah McClanahan, uh, Christopher Jenks, um, mm -hmm. uh, Bell Sawhill, towards a, um, a view that uh, uh, the, the two parent family, the kids do better in two parent mm -hmm. families. It's interesting you say that, though. I mean, I, I, it's interesting um, because I think that there's a lot of class issues at work in some of these conversations. And that, especially in the work of Professor McLanahan, who I've talked to extensively, um, her evidence shows that the, the biggest difficulty or obstacle for children of single mothers are, is financial insecurity. Mm -hmm. And I actually asked her a question, partly, obviously, due to my own um, special curiosity. Um, um, as the single mother of two kids, two different dads, um, whether absent financial insecurity, does a child have a better chance of doing well, so financially equal situations, neither family has financial insecurity, in a married home where there's stress and conflict, is that going to be more or less destructive than the chi a, single, a child with a single mother, no stress and conflict in the home? She very categorically said, it is much more destructive for the child to be in the home with two parents and stress and conflict than the one parent without stress and conflict. And her evidence and her Who's research the that points doesn't up. Have stress and conflict. <laughs> um, I'm talking about stress and conflict in the home. So that's parents fighting and parents, you know, adults fighting around you. So that's the specific stress and conflict she was referring to. Um, and so I have to say, I think that some of the I know people love to kind of quote these studies, and even people who know nothing, and not you, of course, but many people who know nothing about these studies love to kind of wave them around to say, like, single motherhood is going to cause your child to be a shooter, um, like Mitt Romney. But actually, I think people's understanding of what these studies actually say, which are really complicated and go into many definitions of what is, this, you know, these different varieties of singleness. So I, I think the research is a bit more complicated. And we also don't know, sorry, I'll stop talking one second. We also don't understand the world, which is our new world. So the world in which 53% of babies born to, to women under 30 are born to single mothers, we don't know what's going to happen when those children get older. Because part of the problem that children of single mothers have is that they are sort of outcasted or different or other. In a world in which they are no longer that, I think our idea of what family is may be refreshed and renewed and may evolve with the times, as we can see with gay marriage and other issues. Well, thank you. Um, I, you, um, Katie, you spoke in one of your one of your recent pieces about single motherhood, about about uh, sort of support um, the, the question of support for single mothers, and you, you, get, you gave the example of European countries, which which approach um, approach the issue much differently. You mentioned preferential daycare admissions, and um, are there are there ways that you believe that we should be thinking about, like creatively, about how to provide support for um, for families, so that so that the the at least the economic uh, inequality aspect is? Well, I'm so, not. Yeah, I mean, I don't feel qualified to make um, policy proclamations, mm -hmm. but I do see, and what I said in that piece is that obviously we can sort of all agree that being a single mother can be more challenging than having two parents in the home. And I, I was just pointing out, in a place like France, the response to that added difficulty is preferential access to excellent daycare. In England, they, the response is to tax, use, you know, with various kind of amendments to the tax system to penalize single mothers and, and make it much more expensive than it would be otherwise. And in America, our response is kind of moralism. Like, our response is not to help single mothers in various ways, but to judge them. Um, and I think that there are more constructive attitudes. And obviously, we are faced with this incredibly rapidly changing demographic. And rather than think about how can we help this situation, we, say, we immediately carry all these kind of uh, charged assumptions about who these women are and what they're doing and the children in danger and all of these um, fantasies in our heads. I guess I, I w I'm wondering a little bit whether whether it's a it's a chicken and egg egg problem. Like in a society where um, there are greater social supports across the board, um, and you know you you have less. Uh, you you were mentioning people who have a deep economic need to be together. Um, in, in a society where there where there's you know 
universal access to health care or, or state-provided state daycare. Um, you, you have obviously less of, a, of an economic, pe people's decisions about partnering are less driven by, by economics. I, I'm phrasing this question very poorly, but I, but I guess I wonder whether... What, a, what Katie um, was saying is right, I think, in that if the, it's very hard to disentangle in the studies. Um, that sh if you have studies that show that all else being equal, kids in two-parent families do better than kids in single-parent families, the all else being equal is a big, <laughs> is a big problem because all else is never equal. And um, maybe marriage works for those who are married. That doesn't mean it would work for those who aren't married. So the question that gets back to the question is: Are there enough marriageable men? Is there enough? Uh, is the real root of um, the trend towards single parenthood economic? If you had uh, better paying jobs for low and medium skilled men, would the men therefore be more appealing marriage partners? Would those marriages work better? To say that. Um, that kids who are in two-parent families are doing better than kids who are not doesn't mean that you can somehow marry up the other people and those, those kids are gonna do as well. And, and I, I would argue nor does it mean you should. I mean, I just feel like the assumption here that the only acceptable way to raise children, we kind of are bringing some Eisenhower era assumptions to the table here, which is two married parents, two children in their nuclear family in a, their separate house. And I, I just, that's not what America is anymore. And I don't even know if that's what America should be. And I think to possibly change the parameters of the debate and say, maybe there are, maybe some of these people should live together and not be married. Maybe some of these people should, maybe some of these things, like our, our, our assumption that there's one thing we want people to do and that's get married and anything else is bad. I just, it's outdated and I also don't think it's necessarily true. I think that, there are families that work and families that don't. There are married parents, as we all know, you know, and we can read like any book, poem, or play, or watch a movie, and we know that not every child in a household with married parents is happy or flourishing. Um, and even if you want to protect your children and do the best you can and not harm them, you, you can't. You know, you might be able to, you might not be able to. So this idea that we can create a perfect childhood and a perfect childhood looks one way, which we in America are very we like that idea. Um, I just I think it's a flawed assumption. I, I just don't I, I don't know where all this who you're talking about with all these moralizing people. I mean, it seems to me there's been a revolutionary acceptance of a redefinition of America. Well, we've just been talking America. about the Pew polls, which are like documenting higher numbers of disapproval. So, you know, you two can discuss this, but it's a pretty uh, you know I, I think where these people are is everywhere. Where these people are are. You know, it's not really, mis for me to say there are people who disapprove of single mothers, that doesn't seem to me like a controversial or obscure claim. I think it'd be very odd for somebody to um, beam into a New America panel in 2013 and find it um, uh, taking as a given assumption that there's um, a moralism in America towards um, single parenthood. I think what there is is a, is a huge change in single parenthood, and you can debate what its effects are and what its causes are. But well, do you do you mention that that, that there is in fact public disapproval? I mean, fairly there's I forget the, the there's figure. There's public but disapproval in the sense that people feel that it's bad for society, and it's not necessarily the best mm -hmm. way to raise kids. That you know, having one parent, one mother, as opposed to to uh, a mother and a father. So again, the public does not disapprove. Uh, or majority does not disapprove of unmarried couples living together, which would include a single mom and a single dad. Um, they, there is some sense that it's not the best for society to have a single woman having a child on her own without, without a man in the picture. Um, that's, again, a societal attitude, and um, uh, I think some people may be reconciling that in their day-to-day -day reality with people they know, and they may, they may well like and think they're doing a great job. And again, as, as I said, disapproval is ebbing, and most young adults do not disapprove. So I suspect we'll see that attitude permeate society. It's interesting. I mean, I just think about it from the, my strange, warped universe as a single mother. And in my writing on single motherhoods, and I've written a lot of pieces, obviously, about single motherhood, and I get a lot of letters from single mothers who are really all over the country in different demographics than me, different education levels and different economic levels. 
And um, all of these letters I get are, some of them are very long and very detailed, and nearly all of them express that they do feel that there is a prejudice against single mothers, that they experience mm -hmm. it every day in their daily lives. And I think, you know, living within the world of single mothers, I mean, I could name like 16 things that happened to me in the last six months, and it would bore everyone in the room to tears. No, but, feel um, free to <laughs> no but I mean, I'm willing to do it, but, I, but rather than list that, I can tell you that I and all of these single mothers who write to me feel those things. In, and it may be that when you're kind of like stepped outside of this experience, you don't see it, or you don't understand it, or you don't experience it. But I think it's pretty, um, it's pretty clear, as I say, not just where I live in New York City and not just here in New America. And one of the things that I think is a challenge in thinking about this debate is that we're not just talking about right-wing conservatives who have these prejudices. We're talking about the nice New York Times liberal reader who has these prejudices. And so one of the things that to me is so important and why I think like J.K. Rowling's like Lose the Labels campaign and all of that is important is because the way we think about this debate is extremely uh, moralistic, extremely puritanical, extremely irrational, even in educated liberal circles. Um, I wanted to open things up to questions. Um, I think that there was, uh, yeah, you had a, had a mic. <laughs> is there anybody who'd like to ask one of our panelists? Yeah. You would, would not bore me giving me some examples of when you feel the prejudice and, uh, and or, or what other single mothers have told, told you. It would be very interesting to me. Um, <laughs> uh, OK. I mean, I feel like there's so many stories I could mention. Um, one single mother friend of mine, for instance, um, went to a party with lots of kids around. And um, the ho you know, there's sort of kids running around, grown-ups having a party, Brooklyn, liberal, educated circles. And the host says to my friend, let's call her child Finn, um, I just want you to know Finn is always welcome in our house. Which I just submit to you, you would not say about a one-year-old child with two parents. You wouldn't feel like you needed to make that special extra welcome articulated. Um, when I was pregnant, somebody said to me, you know, with my son, and you know, I guess I was sort of, he, he was trying to give me some advice, and he was said, um, you know, why don't you just wait till you have a regular baby? Why don't you wait and have a regular baby? Now, these are little small things. You could be like, she's crazy and oversensitive. Or you could see that um, some of this is, is a little bit it's, it's articulating something, like why is this child irregular? If you look at the word bastard, which we would not use in polite society, one of the definitions of bastard is an irregular child. Okay, So this is our language that we're using today. And I think a lot of it you see in language. When I was pregnant, same period, pregnant um, at my daughter's kindergarten, um, one of the little kids comes out, hand on her hips, five years old, and she looks at me and she goes, when are you going to get married? And now, I, I mean, not to say this prejudice is coming from a five-year-old, but say it coming from something happening in that five-year-old's home, I'm just guessing. So what I'm telling you is I'm living in the most liberal, most kind of like bookish, you know, cultured, tiny corner of the world, and I feel it. And so I don't feel really comfortable sharing like stranger stories and what they say to me, but I can tell you that people feel all of this, you know, and I can tell you, you know, close friends and relatives of mine will step in and say, um, you know, that boy needs a man in the home. You know, you, and, and people will feel that they can ask you, and single mothers, all single mothers will tell you this, people feel like they can ask you to account for your circumstances, like you have to just kind of apologize or explain, like why did you end up this way, what are you doing, in a way that you would not ask a normal um, person with two parents in married in a traditional circumstance, you wouldn't feel like you, they needed to explain themselves so elaborately. So I think there's, you know, again, I could sit here for like 40 years and tell you more stories, but there are a lot of stories like that. And they're little things, but they're not little things because the social, the cultural climate exists in these offhand remarks. It's like that thing that five-year-old said to you in the school drop-off, that's what is our cultural climate. That's where the attitudes are. Right here on the end. 
Hi, yeah, it seems like one of the interesting things about public opinion on gay marriage is that people's opinions on whether they say they approve or disapprove doesn't necessarily correlate, for example, with how they'll vote on it or just on a personal level how they feel about it. So I was wondering if you're planning on doing any more polling about what brings people to say approval or disapproval or if you move to if you plan to move beyond this kind of binary into seeing what opinions led to them saying these things? Well, this actually offers me an excellent opportunity to promo a report that we'll be releasing tomorrow that actually <laughs> is of the LGBT population, so not of the general public, although it compares some attitudes in the LGBT population with attitudes in, in the public. Pew Research has been doing a whole series of reports uh, in recent weeks about uh, same-sex marriage and related issues. Um, and I invite you to, to look at those. Some of them may answer your question and also to look at the report we're putting out tomorrow. Um, here, the gentleman on the end here. I think there's a microphone behind you, yeah. Uh, my name is Bob Patterson. I write for the Philadelphia Inquirer. Uh, G.K. Chesterton once said that in, in assessing any social problem, we have to first identify the social ideal. And I would suggest, I would ask, what is the social ideal in terms of raising children? And a related question would be, we, we've done a lot of talk about what adults think. What do you think most American children would prefer if they had their magical wish in terms of being raised? Would, would they prefer one parent? Would they prefer both their parents? Would they prefer both their parents married? Would they prefer adoption? What, what would most kids consider ideal for themselves? Katie, would you like to take that? Yeah, I mean, I um, think you can't, the problem is you can't ask that question in a vacuum because unfortunately our children who get born on a little desert island where they can come to their fantasies, you know, innocently. The problem is they're born into, an ex into a culture that is very aggressively pushing certain ideas about family on them from when they're six months old. So what their fantasies are, and I think this is, gonna, this is what I think we don't know, because, because our world is changing so rapidly, um, the fantasies may be changing. I, but I can tell you, I think children don't want their parents fighting. Children don't want unhappy parents. Children don't want um, to be sitting there at a dinner table with like simmering rage and resentment between their parents. Like I think we know that. Um, and so children want to be loved. So I would argue to you, I don't think, this is the ideal. Ch we need well-loved children. And what I just propose, and I think I could say could be echoed by um, children if they weren't reading so many little bear stories about little bear families that looked in a certain little bear way, um, that um, the ideal is that they're well-loved and that well-loved children can come from a lot of different kinds of families. That a family, it could be gay parents, it could be single parents, it could be a single dad, it could be whatever it is. The ideal should be well-loved children. And it's, it's frankly the idea that it's anyone's business how other people are raising their children or all these moral judgments. It's, it's what, what I think children want is, is to live in a secure environment in which they are loved. I've um, reported on a lot of single parent families and um, my experience has been that most um, children of those in those families wanted father. You know, it, it, it sometimes comes up in that context, but often it comes up when mom has a boyfriend who moves in and, you know, the kid thinks, ah, he'll be the one. So, I don't know. I've never, uh, I've never uh, pressed the kid, does it have to be your biological father? But, um, you know, I've seen a lot of, I've heard a lot of stories about kids who got their hopes up when mom's boyfriend moved in and then it fell apart. Um, the lady here in the pink. Hi, my name is Samantha Lackman from The Nation. Um, in recent elections, there's always sort of these different terms floating around about moms, from you hear about soccer moms to security moms in 2004 to in this most recent election, there was a new term, waitress moms. Um, but in the last election, there was a little bit more of a, a discussion in the media about unmarried women and what their political preferences was, were and how they were going to vote in the election. Um, and I was just wondering, um, has there been relatively less of a discussion of unmarried women or single mothers because it's assumed that they're going to vote for Democrats and therefore their votes aren't seemed to be up for grabs and is that why the media attention sort of doesn't fixate on them as much as these sort of like mom cater categories that recur every cycle? It's a very interesting question. I just, one of you, would one of you like to take that on? 
well, Katie, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there is the assumption that they're going to vote Democrat. But as I remember when they were talking about the unmarried woman vote, there was some flexibility. And obviously, because we're talking about people from different worlds and different kind of corners of the universe, I think it is, a, it is to a certain extent up for grabs. And I would think um, certainly the Republican Party has made a little bit of an effort to speak in, in slightly more friendly terms about single mothers. Um, but it's, uh, I think it will make a difference, obviously, moving forward. Um, in, and I bet you it will, single mothers may be a factor in the next election in that same way where we're talking about waitress moms, soccer moms. I think we have time for just one more question. Um, uh, maybe this lady here on, on the end of the, the row. Hi, Liz Peters, Urban Institute. Um, the research, we, we've been talking a lot about different kinds of family types, but um, nobody's talked about instability. And the research actually shows that it's instability that is the big factor in affecting children's well-being. And I think that the reason that we see, or one of the reasons that we see marriage being um, in general in the research uh, better for kids is because that's a more stable arrangement on average, if you have um, a kid being born to cohabiting families or to, to cohabiting parents, which is happening more and more, that's a very unstable family type. They break up at much, much higher rates than a kid born to marriage. So I think rather than talking about family type per se, I think we need to really think about the stability of the arrangements in which kids are living. Um, Well, there's certainly, it, what you say certainly is true, and, and for people interested in this topic, I'd recommend uh, looking at the work of Andrew Churlin, especially Marriage Go Round, in which he talks about the, the, the fact that many children today are growing up with sequential parent figures in the household. On the other side, um, I guess it's interesting to note as well that a certain percentage of women who give birth uh, when, they're, when they're not married do, in fact, get married later. In fact, some research indicates 60 to 80 percent do at some point. Uh, so that's that's another kind of transition you see. Get married to the um, some, else. some to the father, some to uh, another guy. I think we are um, we're about to break for for lunch um, for uh, for a little while, and there are, there are sandwiches out there which you can all help yourself to. Um, after lunch, we're going to, to be coming back for a panel on uh, divorce led by, uh, led by Casey Greenfield. So um, look forward to seeing you all after this short break. Live